goes into, oh, somebody's recording me. Got it. And when that stinger goes into a human, it swells a little bit because of our heat and then it stays in the human and it rips the abdomen of the bee and the bee perishes. So honeybees really don't want to sting unless it's last resort. They're trying to protect their hive, their queen, and then occasionally it's where they get caught in especially women's longer hair or you accidentally step on them and they kind of freak out and they will sting. You do need to remove that stinger. So if you got stung this fall, uh, and you didn't have to remove a stinger. It was the lovely wasp that's on the right, the yellow jacket or many other kinds of wasps that uh, exist out there. By the way, there's many different subspecies of yellow jackets. So if you're looking at that and going, that's kind of small. The ones that I have are much bigger. There's many different species of them. Some are bigger, some are smaller. Oh, and one other thing that's probably worth mentioning is the yellow jacket is an omnivore, meaning it will eat anything and everything. It wants your steak, it wants your honey, it wants everything. Unlike the honeybee that is only interested in plant materials, in this case, usually sweet materials, that is nectar-like. They have a proboscis, which is like a straw type mouthpiece, unlike the wasp and hornets that have mandibles that are able to chew and uh, bite. So it's always fun to take a look at these. Uh, have you ever seen these before where this is, this, they put a topic up at the top and then it kind of goes through the conceptions that people have about them. And so a lot of my friends think that I am this crazy scientist, which might be partially true. Um, I like to pretend I am. Uh, my spouse thinks that I just love to hang out with people and puff the smokers. Uh, the neighbors in the neighborhood all think that I'm trying to literally kill their babies. That's why I put hives there because they're going to be, you know, Alfred Hitchcock, the attack of the bees, which is very not true. And a society is so fascinated by bee beards um, I like to think that I am helping our earth um, and our food uh, industry, uh, but in reality, uh, that last picture is pretty much what I'm doing. A lot of lifting. Honey is heavier than water. It is very heavy, and actually, I have my um, MRI on Thursday because of my sciatic nerve, which is very common in the beekeeper's world, so uh, hopefully we can get this buzzing of my foot uh, back to normal. Uh, so. Let's talk Detroit real quick, especially for those that maybe aren't as familiar with Detroit, although maybe I'll share something that you didn't know. This, unfortunately, is what a lot of people think of Detroit. It is just abandoned houses. It is, uh, you know, it's just a big mess. Yes, there are some areas, but show me a city that doesn't have that. My parents, which, by the way, I, I grew up in Grand Rapids. My parents are still over in Grand Rapids and they think I just go to the casinos and dodge, you know, people trying to kill me along the way. Uh, so far that hasn't happened. I'm not a big casino guy though, but um, a lot of my parents seem to think that I'm in danger because I live in the city of Detroit. Um, my friends all think that all we do is, you know, hang out at the ballparks and all the sports stadiums. And at times I do like to do that. The world kind of thinks the only thing that Detroit is good for is vehicles, um, which it, we are the motor city, uh, but do they realize that we have become a real tourist attraction, uh, a great food town, and now we're becoming a leader in urban gardens and urban beekeeping. So Detroit's got a lot more to offer than just automotive. But these are some of the pictures of what I think of Detroit and what is Detroit for me. This is a picture, if you do not recognize, off to the right is the Detroit River. This is on top of the TCF Center. They have a beautiful green roof. We have five hives up there and I'm taking all of their senior staff into the beehives and giving them a little bit of a tour and education about the honeybees that are now living up there um, on, those, uh, on that roof. Uh, this is actually in Hamtramck. I'm setting up the hives on top of Bon Bon Bon. If you've gotten any buns from Bon Bon Bon, our dear friend Alex started that, and uh, we have beehives there as well. Uh, this is at Detroit Bloom, not too far from here in Jefferson Chalmers. It's a little bit of an older picture. That beautiful gazebo in the back is now finished. If you have not gotten to some of the urban gardens uh, and cut flower gardens in Detroit, please. And the bird life is phenomenal. Um, at Detroit Bloom, I mean, the bird life, 
it's it's like I'm back out in the country where I used to live. Um, and so I love taking families in. Uh, this is a dear family. Well, the, the, the couple have been really strong supporters of ours and they wanted to show their grandchildren the world of the honeybees. So we uh, suited up and went into the hives that we have there. This is actually on the uh, historical 615 Lafayette building owned by Bedrock now. Uh, we now have a partnership with Bedrock and there was a bunch of press there uh, when we installed the bees. Uh, do you like the bee photo bomb right here in the middle? Can you see that bee there? Right there. Uh, you know, they, they you know, want a little attention as well. Uh, this is at the downtown boxing gym, which is on Verner Highway. It is an incredible facility uh, that has gotten national attention. They're on the Rachel Ray show all the time. Um, and they have created an after school program for kids uh, to go and learn boxing, to work out. They have a full uh, commercial kit or like a kitchen that Rachel Ray put in there for them to learn cooking. They now have a music studio, a computer lab, and we have four hives there as well. And this lovely lady, young lady, is painting one of the beehives before we put the bees in it. And I did a program called the life cycle of a honeybee and she was my queen bee and I couldn't get her to take my queen bee glasses off. So I was like, you work it, you can do those, even though it's probably a little harder to paint, but um, we have a lot of fun uh, educating the kids there about bees. Um, and this is up on the 615 Lafayette building again, uh, because I have so many hats that I wear and the bees are my passion of volunteering. Um, we put in some, a lot of hours. Sometimes I'm up before the sun to get in the hives. And sometimes I'm uh, in the hives as the sun is setting. Um, sometimes I'm getting into the hives even before I start teaching my fifth graders for the day. I got to take advantage of every minute I can. So now let's talk about this beautiful rebirth of Detroit. That first slide I showed you, that is the same house that you see now on the right. And it was, um, it was um, resurrected, if you will, by our dear friend, Nicole Curtis. Uh, she is slightly famous. She was on HGTV as a few television shows, and we took her into our hives uh, just this last summer. And this is the house that she re- uh, does like brought it back. I guess you didn't say redesign because she brought the design, the original design back, but she brought it back to life, um, which is quite amazing. Uh, and this is happening a lot more in Detroit. But I also want to let you know that bees are not new to Detroit or architecture. I'm going to go through a few very famous buildings that you will probably recognize. Uh, this is the Fisher Building. A uh, gorgeous building. If you haven't been, I would think that if you were in Detroit, you know about this building. Uh, Albert Kahn is the um, designer. Actually, I love Albert Kahn because I live in an Albert Kahn building in Rivertown. Um, and you can see some of the beautiful architecture here that has themes of bees. And there is a reason for that because bees symbolize resurrection and prosperity. And I think it's a great example of what's happening in Detroit right now. And this is the Masonic Temple, the largest Masonic or the largest uh, temple or Masonic Temple in the United States. I couldn't resist the picture in the upper middle is the roller derby girls has anybody gone it is so fun and if i don't know if they are still doing it right now with covid but when they are back in action please do yourself a favor go and enjoy it it is so fun yes there is a roller derby rink in the masonic temple and um actually a couple of our friends are on a couple of the different teams and one of the teams is called the stingers so there's just all these connections and of course the Guardian building, uh, the Puavic uh, tile, and you can see the bee themes, just gorgeous. If you ever get a chance, take the free tour. It is fantastic. And they will even talk about some of the bee themes in that tour. Um, so it shows you that bees have been a part of Detroit and architecture, not just in Detroit, but across the world for quite some time. So that allows me to build the platform a little bit for us wanting to build the B Highway. 
And I want you to understand it's not necessarily meaning that the bees have to be right along the highway, uh, but we do have quite a few hives that are, um, especially up in Oakland County. A lot of the businesses like Mahindra, um, Borg Warner, uh, they host hives and they're right along 75 and 59. Uh, so you can actually see them from the highway. Um, but right now in 2021, uh, we have hit the 200 mark. We're at 202 hives and we're at 63 locations. And this map right here gives you kind of a, a footprint of where we're at. And so now you can understand why my truck has so many miles on it, uh, because I am going to hives constantly. Um, our furthest south is down at... Um, it, it, it's kind of a tie from Detroit. Dundee's a little bit further to Detroit uh, than Monroe, uh, but we're at the Lazy Boy headquarters in Monroe up on their roof. And we're actually at the Stellantis is now what they're called. I, they keep changing their name. I can't keep it straight, but Chrysler for those of you, uh, but Stellantis plant down in Dundee. Our furthest west is out in um, Dexter and Ann Arbor area. And then our furthest north is at Blake's, uh, which is an Armada, which is the cider mill there. Um, and so what we're trying to do is fill in those gaps. You can see it's pretty congested in the city area, although the bees it can sustain it, which we'll talk about in just a second. And this zooms you into just the Detroit area and uh, the rings make it look very complicated, but I wanted you to see it. So let's look at this one out here. That's not, it's a little easier to see. Um, if you look carefully, uh, there are three rings around this. The first one represents one mile, two mile, and the blue one is three miles. And that's about how far bees go from their hive. About a three mile radius, they will go up to five miles, but they prefer to stay close to home because it's less work and they can get more accomplished because they are as busy as a bee. But in the city limits itself, we do have 91 hives at 29 locations. It, it's Detroit's zip code, basically. So what is the bee highway? It is basically giving the three essentials that all living things need. Same as birds as well. Uh, they need shelter, they need food, and they need water. I mean, those are the basic three. And so we are providing shelter by putting up hives and we're encouraging others to help with the food and water. And when you help bees with food and water, you help almost everything with food and water because you are helping to, to build up the base of the food pyramid. And I'm gonna tell you, I encourage people to plant native plants because I don't wanna honey coat this. I know, sugar coat it, but uh, I'm not gonna honey coat the fact that honeybees are not native to North America. They were brought over in the early 1600s because we're an agricultural country. And we would not have the amount of agriculture and food that we have today if we didn't have honeybees. And here's the main reason. Honeybees have strength in numbers. One hive contains about 60,000 bees in the summertime. And that is tens of thousands of bees from each hive going out and pollinating. Unlike most of the native bees that are solitary, meaning that they don't form colonies. They are on their own. And so it would take a lot more of the native bees almost to the point that it couldn't sustain their populations to pollinate the almond trees of California, the um, sunflowers uh, fields of the Dakotas, the orange uh, or citrus trees of Florida. If we didn't have these bees, uh, honeybees, it would, uh, we'd have a lot less food and a lot less food diversity. Um, but I do encourage native plants and here's why. It also helps our native bees and then it helps our native birds. And the bird world is no different than the insect world. We all know that there's a lot of species that are not native, starlings, many different sparrows, uh, a lot of the birds that are now part of our ecosystem that um, can steal. I mean, I know I, I did a lot of bluebirding uh, when I was growing up and my dad and I made hundreds of uh, boxes for bluebirds and they were we were always fighting the sparrows and a lot of the other birds that were stealing those boxes uh, from the bluebirds. But the bee populations when it comes to the native bees um, 
the populations tend to stay uh, in, in flux the same as the honeybee populations. Um, we can get into why their numbers are declining at the end if, if that's worth the question. Um, then, so this is kind of showing you our Detroit hub and then we have our outpost and we're slowly filling in a lot of the gaps. I'm excited to see this older map because we now have bees here in Sterling Heights at the Stellantis plant there. Uh, we now have the bees down here in Monroe. We have bees now in Taylor. We have bees now at the Marathon. So we are slowly filling in and this map is only a few years old. All right, so quiz time. Here we go. Normally I like to do a poll uh, with the Zoom, but it's, it has, I'm not complicating things for, further. So you can just think of it in your head. If I give you the three main areas that humans live, they either live in a rural area, which we usually refer to as out in the country, a suburban area, which we usually refer to um, a city or a township that's outside of a larger city, um, and then urban, which would be like Detroit or a larger city. Which area do you think bees are most successful? What do you think? the rural area, the suburban area, or the urban area? You don't have to answer out loud, but just think of it in your head. All right, if you um, said the urban, you are correct. Actually, honeybees do much better in an urban environment. And a lot of people have been doing tests on this. Our friend with best bees that have bees all over the nation have done a lot of, of testing about this. And it's not because of some of the speculations that you may think. A lot of people think, which it does help. Well, obviously in an urban environment, there's not as much pesticides used because we're not, you know, there's not as many yards to put the, you know, have the perfect yard and get rid of the dandelions and uh, get rid of the bugs and stuff like that. Um, actually, it is the opposite of that. There is more diversity of plant life in urban environments believe it or not. And that diversity is key to success, just like diversity is key to success of really the human race as well. And so when you look at the rural winter survival rate, um, only about 40% of the hives in rural areas survive through the winter. By the way, 30 years ago, the overall survival winter rate was about, or sorry, die out was about 14%. So really about, um, 86% of beehives made it through the winter back before the 80s. Unfortunately, now we're lucky to hit 50. We're lucky to get 50% of our hives through the winter. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, up at the top is pesticides. Uh, the uh, climate change, which I'm sure you're seeing if you're studying birds, uh, we're starting to see some weird migration of birds. Uh, birds are showing up in places that they've never showed up before. Um, and uh, also, um, I said pesticides, I said climate change. There's another one. I, I, it's, it's right there, but I can't even think of it. So I, I apologize. Well, somebody said something. Disease. Disease and, and we have become more global. So that is a big part of it because our bees, we now have to treat them for diseases and stuff like that. Um, so that is a part of it. But I want you to look at the survival rate of the city birds. I'm sorry, bees. Now I'm all bird crazed. Um, about 62%. I mean, that's a significant difference. And then look at even the honey production. In rural beehives, the first uh, year, maybe about 17 pounds of honey from a hive. Uh, if you're lucky, the first year, usually you don't get much at all. In the urban beehives, about 26 pounds. So that's quite a difference. And this has been documented And Detroit actually sits even prettier than a lot of the other cities because we have so many vacant lots now. Um, here are a few of our partners. I'm not gonna go through all of them, uh, but I kind of broke it up into five main categories. Um, and I do want to see if this video will play. I hope everybody in here can hear it. And I hope those of you at home, if not, just somebody unmute themselves and say, we can't hear it. And I'll just move on because it's not really worth it. But this is coming from the perspective of Bedrock and why they decided to do what they did with us on Lafayette. Should start playing. Here we go. It was very quiet. 
we had an urban environment. So you don't think about urban environments thinking of pollination. Uh, bees are an endangered species, honeybees. They're not are endangered. endangered. They help with pollination and so not only flowers, but fruits and vegetables, even trees. I mean, we have very little, but we want to make sure it's producing and, and very productive. I think the misconception a lot of people have is that if you have hives, you have to have plants all over right in front of the hives. And that's not really the case, because like I said, they will go within a few miles to find them. And it's amazing that they do. And when I'm placing hives or thinking about hives, I get the satellite and I look at it and it is amazing how much green there really is. The partnership with Bedrock's great because we're going to be placing six hives on top of 615 uh, West Lafayette. Rooftop bee hives were something that we really want to do, so we found a way to make it happen. We went from having six hives when we started Bees in the D in 2016 to 29 hives last year, and we're, we're going to have over 100 this year. And now we're pollinating urban gardens is a huge benefit. Uh, some scientists believe that 70% more yield comes when there's a bee hive within a two mile radius of a garden. Uh, so obviously more vegetables. The other benefits maybe, you know, it's just education, being a part of this. It, it's all these small businesses are working together. So we've gotten to partner up with, with distilleries and chocolate making places like Bon 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 and Kobo obviously and Bedrock and all these wonderful organizations that believe in us and see the mission that we have uh, for these honeybees. So sorry, that's a little out of date. You heard me say Kobo. That was before they changed their name. But one of the things I wanted to share in there is I talked about how it's higher yield of vegetables, but I want to take it to the natural world as well. It's a higher yield of seeds and flowers and our birds depend on those food sources. And so when you have the bees, it helps everything. It helps the whole food chain, including our birds. And so it's very important to have that pollination, not just for us humans, but for our, uh, our natural world as well. So here you can see some of our more corporate partners. We're right on the Bobby and Garage in the shadow of the Rensen, which is really fun hives to have. Um, and I want to kind of brag about this fun hive that is a prototype hive we made out of a Chevy Volt battery casing. So this was due to go to the landfill and they use some of these to make planters and instead of going to the landfill, believe it or not, this plastic uh, thing right here is the battery cell, except for the battery part um, is taken out. And what I did is I put B foundation on it and created frames. And then they used pallets that they had to construct a lid. It's the battery casing kind of upside down. And you can see the bees took to it. Bees are not very picky about their home. As long as they have a dry uh, cavity that they can uh, live in, um, it, it's, it's quite amazing. And so this was a fun one. This is up on the Bobian Garage, um, downtown Detroit. Uh, this is the bedrock, like I was saying, uh, hospitality. Uh, for those of you, uh, you got to be quick, though, on Black Friday coming up. We have 55 gallons of honey sitting in a bourbon barrel at Detroit City Distillery right now, taking on that bourbon flavor. This will be our third year doing it. Uh, the first two years we sold out in 90 minutes um, because it is a hot commodity. The good news is uh, Detroit City Distillery is going to make more of the honey bourbon because they sold out within the day as well, but they are going to make a lot more and it will also be for sale at the, we're also, our honey is at the new marketplace, uh, Meyer on Jefferson. Uh, so we've developed a partnership with them as well. Uh, believe it or not, this is a dessert. I know it looks like yarn or something. These are edible flowers. You can see some of our honeycomb in there, and that was at Grey Ghost. We have a dessert currently at Besa, also downtown. And we are doing brews now because we have two hives on Eastern Market Brewery and on Founders Roof. And they uh, make some beer brews with our uh, honey as well. And so it's, it's kind of fun to get to use honey right from the roof in fresh ingredients into restaurants. Some of the restaurants where we have hives, we have hives on the foundation hotel. So the apparatus room uses the honey and we have hives on top of the Shinola hotel and San Morello restaurant uses our honey for their menu as well. Uh, this was just a fun little thing that of, of Bon Bon Bon. 
education is my love. That was what I was born to do. And so on the right, you can see I'm at Oakland University where I have uh, eight hives and an educational apiary uh, that we use to do an all day workshop to train people that are interested in being beekeepers. We provide the suits, we provide all the equipment and that allows you to get a little taste for it before you decide that you might wanna invest into beekeeping. We also do this at the Outdoor Adventure Center downtown Detroit. Uh, we have four hives on the Jaquinder Cut and actually DTE has donated a solar panel that you can see from there. And that has live cameras that are in the hive and outside the hive that project into the center so you can see the bees live uh, inside the center as well. Here's the problem, I'm a teacher. They want me to come and teach or do something for their class. I can't be in two places at once. Or can I? What I do is I have the teachers ask the kids questions ahead of time. And uh, then I take those questions and I look through them. I organize them. And then I do a tour and video my tape myself in the hives. And I can say, hey, Billy, you were wondering about the queen. And it allows me to personalize it, but it also allows the teacher to not be under a time constraint. They can play it whenever it's convenient in their classroom. It's working, it's a little extra work, but it's worth it. Uh, agriculture is huge for us. We're at uh, Michigan Urban Farming Initiative. I'm also on their board. Um, the picture up at the top is Youngblood Vineyard up in Ray, Michigan. If you haven't been, you must. Detroit of Bloom I talked about and Blake's I also talked about. So I love this picture, these two pictures I put together. I was able to find a picture from back in the 1950s, an aerial view of the east side of Detroit. And then I just went on Google Earth to get the picture on the right. And I found the streets that connected and continued the picture. But look at the difference. Back in the 50s, every lot had a building on it. It was either a house or it was something uh, factory wise. And now uh, with the, the decay of a lot of the neighborhoods uh, after the riots, uh, there's so much green space. And what's beautiful that's happening is uh, people are buying the lot next door and creating urban gardens. And that's a perfect fit for our bees and ultimately the birds. You know, I'm gonna share with you because this because of this group. I lived up in Lake Orion, right in Bald Mountain Recreation Area. I was the biggest bird fan. I was like all of you and would write down, and you can take my old bird book and you can see all the birds that I would find each year. And I would try to uh, do some of that. And my friends, when I, they found out I was moving down to the city and I'm in Rivertown, they were like, have you lost it? We're concerned about you. What are you gonna do? You know, it took me two years, but I get hummingbirds up on my rooftop terrace that I have now. Uh, I get a lot of uh, goldfinches, cardinals. Uh, obviously, if you know anything about Detroit, there's pheasants everywhere. Uh, when I was walking the dog, the first when I first moved here, I did not know that. And I was like, I heard them. And I was like, that that's a pheasant. Well, I'm downtown Detroit. Why am I hearing pheasants? Um, and then I started seeing them in the vacant lots like crazy. Uh, a lot of bald eagles that I see along the Detroit li River living on it. I've had peregrine falcons land on our roof. Um, and so it is, oh, and then when I walk the dogs on the riverfront, the, the ducks and the geese and the swans. I mean, it's just amazing the different variety of bird life that I get to enjoy now in the city that I didn't enjoy as much when I was up in Lake Orion, uh, the Kingfishers. I love watching the Kingfishers. Um, so a lot of fun birds. And I'm telling you, Detroit is very, it's bird friendly. I, we had, there was a, did you guys see that? It happens every year. The woodcock get lost downtown. I had one right out in our parking lot of our building, a woodcock that I think it might've hit a window and it was kind of stunned, but it eventually took off. And I'm like, I think you're out of place here, mister. <laughs> So it's kind of it's kind of fun for me to still get to enjoy my bird uh, love as well. I'm a huge fan of bird of prey. My dad and I used to go out owling all the time um, and just call them down and they'd swoop at us. It was so fun. So the other thing that's fun about uh, bees in the D is uh, we get to do a lot of research. So mm -hmm. we've already worked with a few universities, uh, Western Ontario, the Lost in Health Research and Seed, which is in California. And unfortunately, like you said, there's a lot of diseases with bees now in their guts. And so um, we created pollen patties, 
one hive would get nothing. One hive would get a regular pollen patty and one would get a pollen patty with probiotics in it. And the bees would eat it all up and some bees didn't get anything. And then we would test the bees guts and see if this, these probiotics were helping out, uh, which they were. And so it's fun for us to get to be a part of research that may help our bees in the future. We also have four hives at University of Detroit Mercy. These are the, this is a picture of them. And actually their biology department has samples of all of our Detroit honey right now. And here's where we're unique at Bees in the D. Commercial beekeepers take all of their honey from whatever hives and they put it in a giant vat. And then they fill it up. It's honey, it's delicious. We don't mix our harvest. So on every jar, there's a little code. And if it had a UD, that means it's the honey from U of D. If it had a TCF, it's the honey from TCF Center. And so because we don't mix our honey, every bottle of honey or every location tastes different. It's like wine. It's a different vintage and every year it's different because the bees go to different sources. So the biology department is taking each of our 27 samples that we gave them from the different city hives and they are uh, analyzing the DNA in that honey. And they're gonna be able to give us a list of every single flower that the bees have visited to make that honey. And that will allow us to then share with the public, this is what the bees tend to go to. This is what we would encourage you to plant in your yard. Or some people believe that honey helps allergies. So if you know you're highly allergic to one of the plants that is more, uh, there's more DNA of it in that honey, it may help with your allergies. Uh, so that's kind of fun. We're waiting for the results yet. Yeah. So what you just said is that you can analyze the honey to determine which flowers. Correct. So why analyzing it, and I'm gonna tell you, I have honey that I can even tell what's in it. Like I have honey that tastes very minty. And I know because it's our Rochester hives where there is a, a ton in the neighborhood that mint has just gone wild or bee balm, uh, which is in the mint family. And so it's fun, the different flavors of honey and the different colors too. Some honey is very light, some is very dark. Right now, the honey that we're getting is from goldenrod um, and goldenrod is very caramely tasting. So a lot of the restaurants want that honey because it, it, it's really wonderful in desserts. Um, and so that's, that's, it's really fun to be able to do that. Um, uh, so it, it's a little more work because we have to do a lot more harvest and we have to keep the bucket separate and stuff like that, but it is fun. And then, um, when you have, um, you know, 200 hives, you got to keep track of them and their health. So we work with hive tracks. It's a, a, a global company. Uh, it's an app on my cell phone. Um, and I just type in all the information that I've done, what I'm doing, the mite treatments, and then they use that data too to see the health of our bees in the Detroit area. Uh, and they, they see trends around the nation. Actually, um, one of our board members is very good with technology and has actually helped them develop their app a little bit further on the phone. And I'm excited to announce we're five years ahead of schedule. Our 10-year goal when we started our foundation or our, our organization was to build an education center. Uh, one of the first pollinator education centers in the nation, actually in the world. And we just bought five lots in Core City of Detroit and from the land bank and Studio Detroit heard about what we were doing and pro bono designed the most amazing education center. I said I wanted to upcycle shipping containers. And so it is made out of shipping containers and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. It used to be just this little side over here. Um, and we're very excited about it. We also want it to be a botanic gardens. And we are now looking at buying the back lot. So we'll have the whole lot, the whole uh, little uh, like block and uh, have an event space so that people can do weddings, uh, yoga, uh, many different things. And also we are looking into the um, rain gardens and talking about the parking lots that allow water to go through uh, so that we can educate about that as well. You can see uh, that it will have beehives up on the roof. That is going to be my 
education center there, but we added another shipping container. So those who are a little, a little apprehensive of going out into the hives, even with a suit on, could watch from there and I'll have a microphone so that it can be projected into there as well. We're very excited. We're doing the environmental testing right now of the land. We hope for it to be completed in 2023. Um, it's in Core City. So if you go uh, MGM Casino, which I use as my guide because we have hives there as well. Um, if you go up Grand, um, um, no, not Grand. Is it Grand River? If, if you go up, uh, it, it's, it gets up into, have you guys seen where they uh, built the um, Caterpillar is what it's nicknamed? It's a big building or True North, which is the Kwanzaa huts. They're like metal huts that have gotten a lot of attention for agriculture. It's right there. Um, if you got to go to Magnet, the restaurant before they closed, it's like literally across the street from there. Um, so it's 14 and I want to say grand. Does that sound right? 14 and grand? Yeah, Grand River. Um, so we're very excited about that. A little ahead of schedule. And uh, we have, uh, we're, you know, doing some fundraising for it, but we do have a single donor that believes in our mission that is going to help make this happen. Yeah. You're, you're talking about all these different hives locations. Is there a central processing area where, where the honey is spun out? So because we do so much honey now, we have to use a commercial kitchen. Mm -hmm. And that's one purpose that this is going to serve. We're going to put a little commercial kitchen in there. Believe it or not, we're using the Gross Point Yacht Club. Every Monday, they are closed, the kitchen. And so we get to use the basement kitchen to process all of our honey. Okay, so then, then because you do the, the site-specific, how do you you keep that from being cross-contaminated? I, I transfer all of the boxes. So they're boxes with frames in them. Mm -hmm. And every box is labeled with a piece of tape and where it's from. And so then what we do is we spin out all of the honey, let's say from TCF Center and the bucket is labeled. And then um, we then clean out the extractor and then do the next location. So it's a lot of extra work, but it's worth it because it's kind of special. specific to each bucket. Correct. There's only a few that we mix because it's for beer and it doesn't matter. Exactly. Yep. Grade B versus a grade A. Exactly. Exactly. And then all the uncapping that we do, all of that falls in one bin and we call that our mix honey. But boy, is it good too. <laughs> So, so then when you do, what are they, five-gallon buckets? Five-gallon buckets, correct. And they're hand-processed where they're filled in jars or whatever? Or correct. Or sold in larger tubs? No, some of it's sold in bulk to the breweries, yes. to kitchens, sure. but for the most part, it's jarred up. We do a light straining, nothing else, yeah. because we want it to stay as raw honey. Um, when you yeah. process it, it no longer is considered raw honey, and so it takes away those good little goodies in it, too. Uh, not really, because the strainer is pretty, pretty, yeah, but yeah, there's a little bit, I'm, I'm sure there's some wax residue in there, but it does strain out pretty much everything. Now in Europe, it's funny you mentioned that, they don't even strain it anymore. They just put it in there, there's bee legs floating around in there, they're like, this is good for us. Now, do you sell comb also? We do have a little bit. We sell that to restaurants because they use it for their charcuterie boards and, and stuff like that. Um, and then, of course, on social media, if you want to follow us, I do a Forager Friday uh, almost every Friday where I talk about it's a one minute video, quick video uh, that talks about some plant that grows in Michigan. Some of them are plants that are invasive, but they're in Michigan and bees will use them. Birds will use them. Um, I do a lot of live uh, uh, in the hive stuff. And we share a lot of bee facts. Uh, we try to do as much as we possibly can. And we also put up our events. We do a lot of great events. We have a honey dinner at the Whitney because we have two hives there uh, where everything's themed. The Gross Point, uh, I'm sorry, the Birmingham Country Club does a honey dinner because we have hives there. Um, we do honey sampling where we pair up with um, like with bee nectar with a, a five different meads. So you can taste the different flavors of honey. The only problem is that COVID is kind of put a little bit of this up on the shelf for a while. We haven't been able to do our BBQ. Uh, that's our big live and uh, silent auction fundraiser. Um, we haven't done it for the last two years because of COVID. Uh, but we get guest chefs from all over the city to create a barbecue dish with our honey. Um, 
and then we do an auction. It's really fun. So if you follow us, you can learn more. And I'm going to close with this video that Full uh, View Productions did for us. Um, and it kind of gives you a taste of it. I'll kind of circle with the cursor a few hives that you might see, but you wouldn't know if I didn't point it out. And then I'll open it up for questions. Um, and we'll see how we do that with friends at home and friends that are here. My name is Brian Peterson Roost, and I am the founder and president of Bees in the D. Bees in the D was started in 2014, but 16, sorry. you have to go a little bit before that, the wrong day. where beekeeping became a part of my life. They were there for me when I was going through kind of a hard time, the bees were. And so when I moved down to the city and was reading about how the bees are now going through a hard time, it was time to give back. The mission of Bees in the D really stems on two pillars, education and conservation. Bees are extremely important to our ecosystem for many reasons. They are pollinators of most of the foods that we eat, and so we need them for our food industry, but they're also important to our ecosystem, something we don't think about. Unfortunately, the bee populations have been declining steadily, not just honeybees, but all bees, even the native bees. So beekeepers are a part of this great big picture because they need to help manage the hives and keep them healthy. That's where Bees in the D comes in. We are helping to provide beehives throughout the city to help pollinate all of our gardens and our plants. So Detroit has become a real leader in urban beekeeping because so many of the vacant lots are now being turned over into gardens and a real part of the urban farming initiative that's happening in the city. One of the things about our organization right that I love is all of the partnerships and then right that we here on the to be Singer a part building, of and the amazing people four. we meet. You can be extremely involved, actually suiting up and getting in the hives with us, or you could be not involved at all. We just need access to where the hives are, and Bees in the D will take care of everything. Let's continue to work together to make Detroit the best it can be. And you guys kick out of this being bird lovers. Up on the uh, TCF Center, the swallows, I just watch. It, you know, it's part of nature. And so I just watch as they swoop down and grab a few of the bees as they're going in and out. I'm just it's like, <laughs> but uh, the swallows love our honeybees, but they don't do enough damage that it hurts them or anything. And it's part of nature. You know, I don't, I don't get upset about things like that. And that pretty much is the presentation. Are there any questions? I saw one chat thing pop up. Oh, sorry about the audience, Mike. I'll try to repeat the questions if they ask a question. Any questions? I, I, it's unclear to me what the smoker is for. Okay, so Bill is asking about the smoker. What's the smoker for? Great question. Um, if this was Beekeeping 101, that would be right on the list. Smoke actually um, mask the alarm pheromone that bees give off. Bees communicate through smell and through dance. That's a whole nother story. The dance part. It's really fun. It's called the waggle dance. But the smoker, uh, the guard bees will give off a pheromone when they feel their hive is being attacked. I can smell it and I know, oops, I got to get my smoker out. Um, and that masks that smell so the other bees don't come as reinforcements. It also gets the bees nervous a little bit that their hive is on fire. Just like if your house was on fire, you're going to take your valuables. So the bees are going to take their valuables. Honey, they're going to fill their honey guts full of honey. And that makes them very lethargic, much like you after Thanksgiving. They just don't have to watch the lions lose. And um, basically, they're very lethargic and some of them can't even sting. Um, and they're just kind of like, okay, just close up when you're done. Um, so that's what the smoke does. I don't have to always use smoke, but uh, usually I do because it does tend to calm them. Yeah. What is the honey gut? I'm sorry, say that? What is the honey gut? He asked, what is the honey gut? So uh, honeybees are very unique that they don't have just one stomach, they have two, and one isn't a true stomach. They have a stomach that digests the food that they eat, but they also have a stomach that basically stores the nectar when they go to flowers. And while it's in that honey gut, it's releasing enzymes. And those enzymes are the magic potion that make honey the most preservable food on this planet. They actually found honey in the ancient pyramids and it was still perfectly good honey. Now, for those of you that don't know this, if it crystallizes, it solidifies. 
Honey will do that if it's raw honey. Still good. You can eat it in that form. It's a little gritty. Some people like to spread it on toast. It doesn't drip if you put it in your tea. But you want it back to liquid, get a pot of water, boil it, take it off the stove. Let it cool for a little bit. Set the honey right in it. Do not microwave it. When you microwave it, it still tastes good and it's, it, it's honey, but it doesn't have all those enzymes and stuff because the microwave will kill that, that are good for you. Um, so that is a honey gut, believe it or not. So you are kind of eating bee vomit when you have honey, but it's okay. It's good for you. <laughs> So what they do is they get the nectar from the flower. It goes right to the honey gut. They then regurgitate it up and pass it to another bee that then puts it in their honey gut, more enzymes. And then that bee regurgitates, it goes to another bee, puts in their honey gut, more enzymes, and then they deposit it into the honeycomb. It's mainly water at this point. They fan their wings over it to evaporate the water. The bees know when it's exactly 17% and then they cap it with wax. It's like putting a lid on a Tupperware container and now it's honey. Isn't that crazy? It's kind of like what we do with maple syrup, you know, with maple sap. We boil it to get rid of the water. Yeah. So where does the wax come from is what he asked. Oh, these insects just get more and more amazing. They make it. They have enzymes. Or, sorry, they have glands on their bellies that make a little disc of wax. And then they pass it to the builder bees that that's their job in the hive. And then they construct the perfect six-sided honeycomb. And why is it six-sided? Because it's structurally very sound. We have learned a lot from bees. We've learned that. And bees also inspired air conditioning. So if you like your air conditioning in the summer, you can thank the bees. What they do is they bring water in when it's really hot, put it in an empty cell and fan their wings. It evaporates and takes the, the air, or I'm sorry, the heat with it when they uh, are fanning their wings to circulate the air out of their hive. And that's where we got the idea of condensers and having air conditioners. Yeah. So a non big question. Yeah. When businesses let you put the hives on their roof, do they commit to anything else or is that all they do? So she was asking about businesses on the roof. Do they commit to others? Every uh, company or business has a, we have different relationships. So obviously with GM and the bigger ones, we're considered vendors. We have a, we have a insurance policy. We have to do workman's comp and nobody's getting paid uh, just because that's a requirement. Um, but they do give us a, a fee for, you know, taking care of the bees. And that's what keeps us going. Um, some places get all the honey and then they uh, either give it to clients or they use it. Uh, a lot of them just donate it back to us and then we can sell it for more money. And then a lot of uh, companies, it's part of their green initiative. Uh, it's becoming very, to get lead certified points, bees can help with that as well. So that's a benefit for them. And they're just trying to help, you know, they're help, trying to help the environment and helping our nonprofit. So great question. You had one. Uh, I'm wondering how many um, residential gardeners, local gardeners have hives. How many residential local gardeners have hives? Are you talking through bees in the D or just themselves? Okay. Beekeeping has become very big in Detroit. I don't know the exact number in Michigan, unlike other states like Florida, you don't have to register your hives. And so it's hard to keep track of the count. Uh, we no longer place residential hives. We have three or four people that have been grandfathered in when we first started, uh, but residential neighbors can be a little tricky. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> and so, so we just would rather avoid that, that conflict. Um, but we do train people to be beekeepers. And if they want to deal with their neighbors in conflict, they can go ahead and do that. Are you seeing an increase? Oh, definitely. And actually beekeeping was a dying art. Um, the numbers of beekeepers was plummeting because the die out was so great and the price of honey plummeted because China, I don't want to get into this big story, but China was making honey that was not really honey. Uh, on Netflix, there's a show called Rotten. The very first episode will tell you all about it. Um, it's quite fascinating and it drove the prices down. So people that did beekeeping for a living just were like, we're done. We're not making enough money for this much work. So beekeeping started to die. Boy Scouts used to have a beekeeping pat, uh, like a patch 
and a badge, thank you. And the Girl Scouts had the patch. So far, we've been able to crack the nut with the Girl Scouts, at least in Southeast Michigan, we brought back the Girl Scout patch. And so we are training young people how to do beekeeping because it is important. Um, and it's becoming actually trendy. I call bees the new pandas. If you remember, the World Wildlife Federation did all the push on pandas and it helped. And everybody was like, save the pandas, save the pandas. The, the whales were kind of popular there for a while. And now you see a lot of literature and news about saving the bees. Um, I think people are starting to realize, yeah, they're pretty important. I like diversity and food. So uh, I'm going to try to help save them. So she asked, well, how do you know when to harvest the honey? Every hive is different. And so usually you do one harvest a year, but there are some hives. I'm going to tell you, one of our hives at the Whitney, I don't know what those bees are eating for breakfast, uh, but man, I, I could harvest them three, four times throughout the summer. So really it's a beekeeper's preference. Uh, when they, uh, they fill up a box and cap off the honey is what it's called. They put the wax on it. It's now ready to be harvested. So as a beekeeper, you can take that box off and harvest that honey right then and there, or just add another box. And so uh, some of my hives, that one at the Whitney, I ended up having six boxes above the two that the queen lives in. I don't take honey out of those. Those are for them for the winter, but I ended up putting six boxes above. And it's, it's a lot of work to harvest honey. So a lot of times we wait until we have a stockpile. Because it's it's a very sticky process. These are out there slaving away, gathering up nectar, creating honey, and you come in and you steal it from them. I'm not repeating what he said because it's not very nice. No, he was like, the bees are working hard and you just go and steal it. Um, we're very lucky that bees are so productive they make more than they need. Um, and actually it may help them in the long run because we also condense the hives for the winter. So it's less surface area for them to have to keep warm. Um, and also when there's honey that's far away from the cluster, that's where pests come in. And so uh, by taking those off of the top, they're pretty compact in there and can defend their hive from wax moss, from hive beetles, from mice, from, well, up north, bears, but bears are going to knock the whole thing over anyway. So uh, we don't have to worry about that here yet. The bears are working their way down, though. I'm from Grand Rapids. They just they just had a mom bear and two cubs downtown Grand Rapids. So it's happening. <laughs> Any other questions? What about in virtual land? Is there an advantage to using roosters in the ground level? Oh, that's from Mike. Um, really, no, bees don't care. They don't care where they are. The advantage for us, it's a wasted space in a city. And I don't have to worry about uh, people knocking over the hives or messing with the hives because it's up on the roof. It's a little less convenient for getting the honey out and harvesting. Um, I have some roofs that I literally go straight up two stories, a ladder like this, and have to lower down. It, it's a lot. It, 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 and by the way, I'm scared of heights. <laughs> so... Um, it, but it, it is, it's a great wasted space that we are now utilizing and they're protected up there. I will say in the wintertime, I do have to wrap the hives on the roof because it gets pretty windy up there and that helps keep the wind a little bit more at bay. We strap everything down because it, obviously it's windier higher up. Good question. Any others? And just one last question for me. I, I, I have more, but... So you've got this, these overlapping circles from hive, the hive here, hive there, that, that you know, you've got a whole bunch of clusters of hives. What happens if a bee from one hive sees an overlaps with another bee from another hive? And it's like, hey, buddy, how you doing? Or are there bee fights? So basically uh, what Bill asked, right, Bill, uh, was because there's overlapping and actually hives right next to each other, because we do a minimum of two hives, it's a whole reason for that, but um, do they fight? Do they, you know, are they territorial? Are they, yes and no. For the most part, bees are so focused on what they need to get done that they could care less about the other bees. They have a mission, they're gonna accomplish it. 
Be, worker bees, by the way, only female bees do work. Male bees do no work. Uh, go ahead, get it out of your system, ladies, okay? Um, and the drones actually is only about 5% of the hive. Drones are boys. But I will say this, they only live 30 to 40 days because they literally work themselves to death. That's how, the, that's where the expression busy as a bee comes along. Now, with that said, if there is a weak hive around this time of year, especially a honeybee hive will go in and rob them out and destroy them. Uh, and so we have to watch for that as beekeepers because it's survival of the fittest. They want to survive. But do bees go in each other's hives? No. Each hive has its own pheromone. pheromone. The queen gives off a smell and that's mama. And if anybody comes in that's not a part of that family, the guard bees will shoo them out. Uh, and guard it from him. So we actually close up the, the entrance a little bit this time of year. So it's harder for like yellow jackets and stuff to get in. They have a smaller door to guard than a bigger door, basically. Kathy, I see a virtual hand. Did you want to unmute yourself? I think I'm going to ask you, where can we buy your honey? Oh, um, so you can get it online if you don't want to leave the house, uh, but the shipping is a little expensive because we only use glass jars. Um, and by the way, that's why our honey is a little bit more expensive. We only source local products. So we get our jars from downtown Detroit at a Porter Bottle, and we use a label company in Senderline because we believe in Detroit taking care of Detroit. Um, but if you want to go to a store, the new market town um, Meyer on Jefferson that just opened up. It's worth a visit. It's a beautiful store. Uh, we are there. We actually took all their senior staff into our hives. Um, and we're up in Clawson at Leon and Lulu's. Um, and also our honey jars are for sale in the lobby of the Foundation Hotel. I think they finally put their products back out. They were, they put everything away for during COVID, but I, they just ordered more from us. So I'm assuming that that's the case. And then whenever we have events, a lot of times, even like this one, I would bring honey to sell, but um, sorry guys, I didn't. Um, we, we can't keep it in stock because we're not really in the honey business, but it helps support our, our nonprofit. Uh, we're more about education and conservation. We also make lip balms. We have seven different flavors because we don't want to waste the wax from the harvest. Um, and so we source out our wax. We have a partnership with Motor City Candle who does a candle. Uh, we have a partnership with somebody that makes the wraps that are coated in beeswax to replace saran wrap. It's better for the environment. We work with Super Dope Organics. Uh, they make some beauty products. Um, so we have a lot of wonderful partners that use our products because we don't want to waste anything. Like you said, those bees worked hard uh, to create um, that wax, that honey, uh, all the different products. Thank you. Uh, the Myers at Jefferson and about Rivard, I think. Yeah. It's sandwiched between Larned and, and Jefferson. It's, 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 it's a really nice little market. A lot of local products there. Brian, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Please do. Say thank you again, Brian. Um, we appreciate you uh, coming out this evening. And uh, that's it for tonight. We'll be meeting next on uh, November 15th, uh, usual time. Uh, our speaker that night will be Sarah Winicky, a PhD candidate student uh, at the uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She'll be coming to us remotely from Illinois. Uh, her, uh, Sarah's MSC project, affectionately known as Pr Prairie Babies, assess the impact of brown-headed cowbird presence on the growth of, growth of grassland bird species. Of course, we all know locally the impact the brown-headed cowbird had on the Kirtland's warbler. Um, so um, COVID is on the rise around the state. If the uh, numbers continue at their current pace, we'll be about 5,000 cases uh, a day, averaging about 5,000 cases a day next month. Uh, so that's a good reason to go back to remote. So we may very well do that and have this room closed, but we're going to cross that bridge when we come to it um, later this month, early next month. We'll see, I hope to see you in November. Knock on wood. Thank you all for coming here. Thank you all for being out there. Good night. Thank you.